Yes. Um, well, so yeah, so Caribe, Caribe Sub or Carib Sub is, um, is a company that was created now almost two years ago. It actually launched at the beginning of the year. And what we sell is pretty much inflatable paddle boards. That's it. We don't go for the uh, rigid market. All we do is inflatable paddle boards. Necessity is the mother of invention. Um, obviously, this, these boards we've created. I don't think I know you. Yeah, you have to have that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> So uh, uh, obviously the, the, we didn't create the, uh, the, uh, the idea of these inflatable paddleboards, but we actually improved it a lot. We increased the quality, we increased the designs, we actually made it more um, attractive and more actually conscious about the environment too. Something huge that we work on is almost every board and eventually every single board will be attached, will be actually linked to a foundation. This one here, Tortuga, obviously the turtle. We work with the Sea Turtle Conservancy Program, which is real life of here. And uh, every board that you buy, you get to adopt the turtle. And you actually get to give it a name and track it online. We also work with the Save the Manatee Foundation, which is out of Orlando. It's a Jimmy Buffett um, foundation. We track it online. So the idea is that not only we sell the product, but we also give back to the community. And we take care of the environment where we actually play, which is the ocean. The main features about our boards, uh, they're extremely durable. You're going to see a video next up, after this, but they are made out of so are the uh, tenders. Uh, it's extremely rigid when inflated, but it's also easy enough that you can fold it, and it's really hard to puncture them, extremely hard to puncture them. Obviously, you don't get any cracks like the other boards, you don't get any dings on them, and um, they tend to last longer than a regular board. They're easy maintenance, no cracks on dings, very lightweight. Usually, they tend to be lighter. Um, they go around 25 to 27 pounds. When, um, when you put the whole combo, it's around 30 pounds. Now, that means that you can actually check it into an air, airline. You, we travel with them all over. We've been all over the Caribbean, uh, South America, Canada, Mexico. And the plan is to continue traveling. That's how it actually looks the whole package. And it comes with the pump, medium pump. It comes with well, the paddle and the uh, paddle board. Great for rentals. We're doing really good in the rental area. Uh, resorts, um, a lot of uh, rental places. I'm not sure about Orlando. We've been working to increase our presence around here. But the idea is that if you're going to rent them, it's easy for people not to you know, beat them up. They actually last much longer. They, during the off season, they can actually deflate it and put it in a closet. You don't need the, the storage room, as, especially as a small company. We also work with a lot of um, yogis, uh, sub yoga. I don't know if anyone here have done it before, but it's, it's a really good thing. We were just doing it um, two days ago, three days ago, and it's a hell of a workout. And on top of that, um, all these yogis are trying to start their own business. They don't have the capital to purchase the um, rigid ones, they don't have the capital to actually have a trailer to move them, and during the off-season, they don't have a place where to store them. And obviously we have wholesale discounts. Go ahead with that, I say bottom left. extremely resistant on the seams. A lot of competitors, you can go to Walmart or you can go to uh, Costco and purchase a $300 board, but they usually are not as rigid, and on top of that, they tend to um, deflate or actually explode if you put a lot of pressure on them. We actually go above and beyond so that doesn't happen. Few uh, facts about the industry in 2013, it was the most first time participants or any sports in the US is booming everywhere, from cities like St. Pete, Miami, um, Cape Cod, any, any other big cities, Chicago, also Orlando is growing a lot. 4.2 million was the number of people who tried them in 2014, and this is only in the US. 25 to 40% of business in the kayak industry actually are seeing uh, money being received from the sub-industry, and eventually we'll see a charter 
eventually this is going to take over. The, the sub industry is supposed to take over the kayak and the canoe. 1,100 is the average cost of the board. We sell for $879.99. It's our smallest board. We've seen it here. It's a 10 by 32 by 6. Next one up is an 11 by 34 by 6. It's a yoga board. And the next one, that's $9.99. And the next one up is a $12.45 or $12.49.99. And that is a uh, 12. As a uh, fishing board. We actually said coolers to it, just like the Yetis. You can put it in the bag and the fish, you know, sit in on it, ask stand on it, so you get to see better. You can go to the next one. This is what I was telling you guys. The trend for paddle boards this is out of Google. Increased, obviously it started around, it actually started way before 2005, but it's been increasing um, up to 2015. And we can see the next one up. That one actually compares kayaking, surfing, rafting, canoeing, how the interest on uh, especially on search on Google, actually, is decreasing. And the last one, um, this is actually the uh, inflatable paddle boards. It, within, this is within the last uh, five years, how it's also increasing the search for the actual term inflatable paddle boards. So not only the paddle board industry is growing, but the inflatable paddle industry and the interest about them is also increasing. A lot of people ask us if we created it, which is hard to say no. But we did it, but we actually made it much, much better. And that's, that's what we pushed for. That's why our slogan is the best inflatable pattern. Next one. And that's pretty much it. Um, like I said before, we are committed to not only sell an amazing product with the best technology, with the best quality, with also one of the best designs that we see in the market, but we're also committed to help the community around us. Uh, part of the program, we still have two boards that are kind of Lonely, that needs some sponsorship. Flamingo should be easy. It's a flamingo. Should be pretty easy to, to link it to any flamingo um, adoption program. Sadly, it's been, it's been really difficult for us to reach out to them and, and get them to work with us. We tried cancer in the past. That's even, that's even more difficult. They really want to make a lot of money. They want us to pretty much promise $20,000 a year. Otherwise, they wouldn't take us. So we pass on that. The blue one, the uh, Lamar, which is our fishing board, that one is already, we're just going to start two weeks from now with Shark Angel Foundation. They protect the sharks and especially the uh, hammerhead sharks. So that one, when you purchase it, you're going to get an adoption certificate, you get to fill it, you get to name it, give it a name, and you get some gifts with the, with the purchase. And the last one is the palm, which is my favorite one, this one here. And um, that's a palm tree. Same thing, we, we tried to reach out to. We actually talked to surf riders, which is a large, really, not all, but I mean, they've been around for a long time and they're huge. And they're really interested in actually uh, jumping on board with us. They help a lot of people get back on the waves. They help a lot of uh, veterans of war and a lot of people with uh, disabilities to actually go out in the water and enjoy it. I don't know how you, do you guys put a pulse here or not? It's MP mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay, so how to help? Oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, what is it that we would love to take from you guys? Number one, obviously, the purchase in the product. We actually created a coupon code for this specific event. Is it one million? Once you type that in, you're actually going to get 10% out of everything, including the boards. Next one out is uh, as an investor. Right now we're three, uh, three people involved with the company as, as the, uh, I'm the main owner, and then I have another two partners. But we're also looking for more people, especially people that could bring something else but money. And that's huge, especially for the students, learn that money is good, but if that's all they're bringing on board, eventually you're gonna run out of that money. You need that help for, to, you know, to grow the business. Uh, we prefer loans. It makes more sense, you get the money, you pay it off, have a nice day, and, and things go well that way. And obviously, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, we have amazing pictures, amazing videos, we spend a lot of time on, uh, on our social media, spend a lot of time doing videos and marketing, is our core, is how we uh, you know, grow, is how we reach out to potential customers, and it's a lot of fun too. 
And please share this story with friends and family. One more thing is we're actually looking for two things in the community, especially in a young community. Um, brand ambassadors, and the way it works is we work with you guys, we give you a lot of promotion for your own website, for your own uh, Instagram accounts or Facebook. And we uh, give you a code. If you get to sell five boards, you get one free. And then after that, we'll actually help you guys out with commissions too. As it grows, your commissions will grow and eventually you get to make It's a lot of fun. So if you get your own board, we we'll bring you back after the fifth one. If you don't, we are willing to come out here, you know, take some pictures, help you guys out. You sell them, then you get the free board. And interns, we we're looking for that too. Either through a program with credits or just directly with us. Any questions? I'll go ahead. I'll kick things off. Um, I didn't quite understand. I'd love for you to clarify. So every single board design has some kind of charity tie sponsorship. Can you elaborate a little bit on those relationships and how people know about them? Yeah. Well, it's, it's my background is in business and, and marketing and anthropology too. So you know, obviously the idea. Um, not only you giving back to the community, which is huge, but you also working with these large companies that will actually give you, or foundations that will actually give you more exposure. So let's say for the Tortuga one here, um, with the Seed Turtle Conservancy Program, they have thousands of followers on every single media. So what we do is we work with uh, photo shoots, we promote them in our media, and a lot of times they do repost, they will uh, mention on their own media, they, they actually give out this newsletter every week, and they include that in the newsletter. On the newsletter, they actually include the fact that you know you guys should check out Caribe. They're helping us out. Go ahead and purchase a board, and you get the certificate. If you were to buy your own certificate of, of adoption, it's going to be around sixty dollars. So obviously, we get in that we we chip in that in for you. So when you purchase it, you were saving money. They're selling their um, uh, certificate, and we all get the exposure. That's how it works. Thanks for coming this morning. You explained a lot about your marketing plan and the relationships. Yeah. Could you explain a little more about your sales channels? Not just the internet, or do you have a direct sales channel, and how is that growing? Yes, the way that, um, the way that well, my background too is in sales, more than 12 years now. And the way um, that we're creating this, obviously, fonts are limited. It was, it was all pretty much funded by me for the first year of it, and then after that, just recently, I had these two other partners that jumped in. But the idea was that we will start, obviously, with internet and, and try to do the online e-business and, and e-commerce and try to grow that. And obviously, that's where you actually get the most um, profit, that's a bigger margin. But we also work um, in uh, three different ways. We work with local retail stores. We sell them in different levels. We actually went out and did a marketing research and figured out what was it that the other companies were offering. Since we're the new guys, we can start at the top. Just so you know, this board is A79, my competitors, which is exactly the same dimensions. Quality is actually below, it's gonna be 1300. So we're the new guys, we can come out at 1300 right now. The idea is to increase that. So number one, we go e-commerce. Uh, e number two, we go through what would be the retail and directly. We're trying to work into more distributors, so they actually take care of the retail. But like I said, the funds are limited, so the more we branch out, the less money we'll make. And we are targeting our company as a premium paddleboard, and that's crucial. All of the videos, all of the pictures, everything is, is, is aimed towards that specific market. We don't want to be the cheap one. I actually have connections with uh, uh, Costco. We don't want to be that guy. We don't want to sell in volume. We prefer to sell to you know, select group of customers. Did I answer that question good? Thank you. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, sir. The last several years I had an economic development program in the U.S. Virgin Islands. I'm curious, uh, where are you originally from? The company is out of St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, okay. And we also have offices and, and offices. We also have a presence and a warehouse in Miami. Okay. But um, The reason I was asking is that there was a business planning competition about a year and a half ago in which a uh, paddleboard sale 
one a prize, and it's a portable sail that attaches you to the regular paddleboard board, so you can actually erect it on a standard paddleboard. I mention this because they were confronting many of the same issues that you are, distribution, how to get a product out there. It's a different price point, but it seems that <clears throat> your product and theirs may be compatible. So <clears throat> after we're done today, I'm going to give you some contact information for them so that you can explore that if that's of interest to you, because they do have distribution in the uh, Caribbean now, and I presume that's going to be one of your biggest markets. Perfect. Yeah, yeah we're doing really good. The idea is, obviously, with the U.S., you've got to work with the weather. Um, let's say Michigan, obviously, you know, 1,000 plus lakes, so that's an amazing market, but it's, it's too short. So the idea that we did is we started up, and now we're moving south. We've been selling in Colombia already, Venezuela, Brazil, uh, the Bahamas, Bermuda, but that was unintentional. You know, that's happening because of, of our connections. And, and, you know, I grew up in Venezuela and, and been to 34 countries. So it's part of, you know, I have all these friends around the globe that like the product and they've been purchasing. But, yeah, eventually that's the idea. And, and I appreciate that, that contact. Next question. Yes, sir. I don't know if I heard you wrong. How long have you guys been a uh, company? The company was created two years ago. Then after that, we actually launched officially uh, at the beginning of the year. Yeah, two years ago then, they, they, it was created officially in August of last year. And then we actually launched on Monday at the Surf Expo. And by, no, we started on Monday and by Wednesday we were at the Surf Expo. Sharing the floor with Quicksilver, with uh, you know, Mistral, Red Paddle, with the big guys. So it was, nice. it was pretty intense. How long from the, the concept? of the idea to launch? That'll be two years now. So two years. Yeah, and now manufacturing so, experience. So four years crazy. conceptually this has been alive? No, no, two years overall. Oh, overall. Yeah, okay. sales has started the week of the you know, Surf Expo, which is January 10th. Did you, did, did you have a pre-sale where people pre-bought your boards before you made them? Yes, sir, we did that. And um, we also, right now, we, we actually ran out of, out of inventory within one month and a half. Oh, good. We were shooting for four months, and then we had, which is, you know, we we're happy because of that, but then eventually throughout the summer, for the last two months, we've been out of stock. Now we're fully stocked again, and what we do is that we do a pre-sell. We're actually coming up with a new board, a fifth board, a uh, sixth board, that is a sub-X. It's actually for CrossFit. It's a new thing. They, they just use it in the uh, CrossFit uh, Olympics, so now that's a new board, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to create a few samples, pictures, media pre-sale and then bring them all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Eric. Uh, you said there was four million people tried your board. Can you explain that? That's, well, those numbers come out of, and, and sadly they don't have the most recent, that was in 2014. They don't have the latest numbers, but um, the idea is if there is a panel board association of manufacturers and they came up with did a research and came up with those numbers here in the U.S. And the way it works is pretty much sent out a bunch of you know, questionnaires and trying to figure it out um, more about the industry. Again, it's something relatively new, especially on the, on the you know, people, the actual, a lot of um, athletes know about it and for years have been racing and they've been competing nationally and all over the world. But the end user, like you guys, a lot of people don't know about it or just find out about it for the last month, sorry, last year. Inflatables even earlier than that. People know about it for the last five months or six months. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, my question, I have two questions. The first question is, you said uh, it's healthier uh, healthier for the environment. Are you guys using recycled materials for the boards? The PVC that they're made out of is not recyclable, or at least that's what we're hearing from our um, manufacturing side. But it's something that we, we are trying to move towards that. Same with the packaging. Right now we're using, uh, we, we just switched from regular tape to graph tape, which is recyclable and actually it's way better. The next thing will be the boxes too. Right now we're 50% recycled material. We wanna go to 100%. And actually a lot of companies are doing it. No one in the paddleboard industry um, use recycle the box without going through the manufacturing side. Meaning if I receive a box from Amazon, I just turn around the box and ship it to you. We'll put a small tag recycled too that says, sorry, you know, sorry, it doesn't look that good, but we're recycling. So that's the idea. Um, and then my second question was, you uh, said that you come up with the concepts. Are these boards already made in, by the manufacturer you 
rebrand them, or are you innovating the boards themselves? We, we did a few innovations. Um, the way it worked was I also have a uh, consult, international consulting firm, international trade consulting firm, and throughout that I was... Uh, yeah, throughout that I was talking to, um, I, I ran into the product and I was already paddleboarding, so it made sense for me. The person that I was working or consulting for didn't, didn't want to uh, invest in the brand. She wanted just to buy and resell to resorts and hotels and that's it. And um, I, I told her that it made more sense to create a brand and actually create a following and, and we actually sell it as a lifestyle. And that's what you're going to see in the videos. Same with, um, we sell paddle, we sell coolers, we sell hats, the straw hats, we, you know, it's just not the board. So, yeah, we improved, this is the actual, the, the center fan is the actual fan that matches every single paddle we right now on the market. A lot of inflatables sell these fans are kind of like a toyish, so you're going to use it five times, it's going to break, and then there's no one else that can sell you that. Ours, you go to any shop and you can buy it. Um, side fans too, most of them have incorporate side fins or side kicks and then you can't remove them. If you can remove it, you fold it, it's going to mark the product. Or you can just take them off. If it's flat water, if you want to surf with them, you put the fins on it and then you take it out. We also added the uh, ring for yoga or for towing the board. We've done a lot of uh, uh, wake surfing with it, you know, with, with, the, with the boat and that's what we tow on first. So we tried to do that. We innovated it. We also, as you saw, we increased the thickness. We increased, uh, we did a few safety measures, so a Jeep that's 6,000 pounds can drive on top of it. Next question. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. that was you. Oh, sorry. No, I'm just trying to play by the rules. Let's go set the mic. One of the things I'm looking at with what you're doing, and I'm not seeing anything uh, being referenced to, strategic alliances. There are all kinds of, whether it's in the fishing side of things, whether it's in personal watercraft, these are potentially companies that may down the road even say, hey, let's diversify, let's swallow up a company like this because we see where the market's going. But the nice thing is, is that they're talking to the same kind of people that you need to be talking to. And if you build a strategic alliance where they're referring to you and you're referring to them, you will get far more business than any salesperson on the street yeah. will ever bring in. Yeah, so just to, are you working with anybody? Uh, it is a great idea, and we're actually starting to develop that. Um, part of that is obviously the foundations that help us, you know, the foundations that we give to and donate to. They're actually helping us to put the word out there. Um, so take partnership per se, we are working with paddles. We sell it with a paddle, but, and that's something I learned and, and is huge is at the Watches, everything you can imagine, but obviously, the, you know, the wider you go, the more inventory you need. So right now, we're trying to pull back, and uh, the paddle market, we don't want to mess with that. We want to jump with one of the best paddle companies out there and let them take over that side. We just resell them for them. Um, same goes, we have a lot of athletes that are helping us, and that way, we're putting the word out there, we're sponsoring them. Uh, we even have a dog that's, a, that's an ambassador, Hansel, and he's out of uh, California, he serves. And you see these dogs right from the boards. So we are doing it more right now in the marketing area. But yes, we definitely need to jump into more business partners that can you know, put the word out and, and help us out. And we do it with stores too. Once someone is selling our boards, we, we run a full week or two of promotion to them and say, you know, go to take uh, Nautique, Miami, the, the boat manufacturers, they're actually buying our boards. So we say, no, make sure you go there, there are our distributor in Miami and so on. Did I? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, what I was thinking about though is that small watercraft that aren't competitors to yours, like rowboats, canoes, I mean paddle boats, it, it goes on and on, even small motorized craft. Those companies, uh, if you were to say, hey, we'll send you business because we always have people going on this, do you, do you sell these? We go, no, we don't do that. We'd like to be able to have somebody that we can work with to refer them to. You do sell paddle boats, you do sell canoes. Uh, in the meantime, we'd like to know that if you ever had people coming in there and you would carry our brochures, would you be willing to work out a cross-referral system with us? Yeah, we, we actually, and, and that's why it's tricky with the media, like this place right here. Surf Expo, which is happening tomorrow, the rest of the weekend. 
it's madness. It's every single company is there, and you know everyone's cutting each other's throat and dropping their prices, and that's not our market anymore. We're doing it once a year. It's too expensive to. What we're doing, which is going to boat shows, and that's a huge market. We go to boat shows. We're friends with the manufacturers of big yachts. One of my partners is a yacht broker. So when you sell a yacht that's $2 million, these things are just a gift. Actually, and they do it that way. They tell them, we're gonna give you five boards if you buy this one. And they're paying for it, but that's the idea. So yeah, we're doing it in a small, you know, small scale, but it is to grow, grow. Uh, sailboats, yachts, uh, small power boats. That industry is what we're targeting, not so much the hardcore guy that goes and competes, because the boards are, even though the performance is really good, you cannot compare it to a carbon fiber board that you know, is going to cut through the water and, and win the competition. But a lot of our um, consultants, too, are racing guys. So that's what we do. We are working with at that level. But yeah, I definitely, we need to grow more and into more larger companies. Is there anyone else looking for the microphone? Because they have one more thing to bring up. Oh, hi. Go ahead, Don. I'm after you. OK. <laughs> uh, just real quick, the other the thought that was just hitting me is never apologize for being who you are, right? What if you are the best? Do you believe you're the best? Yeah. Okay. There is nothing wrong with having something that's more expensive than your competition. You'll probably sell more of those than you will of the ones that are under. Every day, yeah. And actually, I had this talk to my partners because they weren't too happy about the, the best in Florida paddleboard. But I know that, it, that we are the best. And again, not only they look amazing, no one out there is giving those certificate of adoption. No one there is giving more to a society, more than just buying it. And on top of that, the quality is really good. And uh, the idea that inflatable needs to be cheaper because it's inflatable is, is, is changing. I mean, if you think about it, now you can travel on this board. Now you can just throw in a plane and go wherever you want to go. Now you can climb a mountain and then paddleboard on the little lake that's on top. So it shouldn't be cheaper. It shouldn't be seen as cheaper. And it's hard as a uh, startup to be, you know, people asking for discounts and say, oh, yeah, I'll drop the price. But no, the product is, I tell them that we sell the Porsche, we sell the Ferrari, we sell the Lamborghini. Like, we don't need to be dropping our price. We don't need to be bargaining. A lot of stores, they want 40, 50, 60% uh, margin discount for them to sell it, and I pass. Mm. Next question. Good morning, Luis. I have a question. Um, let's say you get an order for 10,000 of these. Are you able to scale right now? Are yeah. you able to grow? Do you have the manufacturing and operations in place so that if a big wig came in and ordered a whole bunch, you can ship it out, no problem? Yeah, the way they works is, um, obviously wholesale, they, they understand that they can wait. You know, someone orders that, they, they want to assume that they're going to get it in 30 days. But um, something that came from my experience doing, I also have experience with international supply chain. I was international supply chain manager for a foundry for eight years, and you put your eggs in different baskets. So right now, I was able, or we were able to standardize three different manufacturing facilities in three different countries. So if something were to happen here, or there was an economical crisis in a specific country, we are able to move to the next country without affecting quality, without affecting the science, without affecting any of that. So yeah, I mean, we, we could do it. Obviously, it's, you know, it's not that easy, but we definitely have the, the room to work around that. Next question. All right, this is our last question. So I know you kind of answered this, but just reiterate, in the spirit of One Million Cups, we always close with, what is the number one thing that we can do for you as a community today? As a, well, first of all, thank you so much for all the feedback. That's, that's huge. But I, I got that already, so that's good. Number one will be, obviously, to purchase a product or to put the word out for you guys that, that know people that paddle. Again, this is huge, it's growing a lot, and a lot of people are looking for a product that's gonna be good quality, but at the same time you can travel with, and at the same time, you don't have to spend that much money out of it. And eventually the price is gonna go up, so this is definitely the opportunity. Thanks, Louise, let's give them a big round of applause. Okay, so we're gonna take a quick coffee break because we have a video to show and a presenter to work with. So everybody take about two minutes and we'll call you back in. consulting company uh, that did some due diligence for private equity groups where intellectual property was involved in the infrastructure space. So it became a very narrow focus. After bringing a couple of products to market, I made the decision to start a business on my own. 
The technology we're going to talk about today, I learned about in 2008 and 2009 while I was doing due diligence for a private equity group that was interested in acquiring the equipment that Mr. Polston, for whom the company's named, built. We subsequently built a later generation, which I'll talk about. As CEO, I believe it's you know, my principal responsibility is to be looking out the windshield of the uh, car we're driving, so to speak, and looking to the future, also identifying the relationships that are critical uh, with our financial partners, with our banks, with our suppliers, uh, with our big customers. All of those things I see as the uh, responsibility, and they have ebbed and flowed uh, since we started. We started this company on February 1st, 2011, so it's four years, six months, and 29 days since we've been involved in doing this. Who we are. We were solved to solve uh, the problem that we've been most significantly uh, successful in solving is in the wastewater industry. Uh, there are a number of processes that have uh, debris that is uh, accumulated while processes are running. Wastewater treatment happens to be one, and it's one that you can easily understand and visualize, but essentially, because of the aging infrastructure pipes and, and other infrastructure in the United States, a lot of sand, for example, gets into wastewater treatment plants. That sand takes up valuable resources, affects the treatment efficiencies, and drives the energy cost up. The, we, Mitt Pat Polson, who is the inventor, has been working on the technology since 1989. Uh, our company owns the intellectual property. We license the use of our trucks in territories and we generate revenue through royalty model. We, have, um, we could be simply a manufacturer, we have, and we currently have a manufacturing partner in Cedar Falls, Iowa. We're in the process of scaling up our manufacturing from a couple of units a year to uh, 48 units per year is what our target is. Those trucks will go into territories and into municipal areas uh, where they can be leased. What we have is the combination cubed. There are a number of combination trucks in the industry. Combination trucks are vacuum. Vacuums suck like they do at home. A vacuum uses air to move debris. So when you vacuum at home, it takes the air, the bag catches your debris, and the air keeps going. What we have is a downhole pumping system hydraulically driven. We move slurries. We take material that's in water, run it through a pressurized system. The water returns to the system we're cleaning, and everything that has a specific gravity greater than water stays in our container. The, the, our equipment looks like this. This equipment cost, our first prototype was in excess of a million dollars um, to build this piece of equipment. Uh, these, these trucks have a price point of between north of 500000 and 750000 is the range of this equipment um, when it's built. What you'll notice is some of the unique features that we have been able to build into this equipment, which gives us an opportunity to serve a segment in the market that is not served at all. And those are systems that have to stay in operation in order to operate. Uh, the next one, here's an example of the sort of things we do. On your left is a picture. That's 280 yards of sand. That's 17 loads to a, to a landfill. That material is causing enormous problems. On the bottom where you see the arrows, you see aeration, uh, aerators. Those are trying to drive air up through the water. So in the wastewater treatment process, oxygen is very critical for the process to work effectively. When those aerators are covered, you're driving up your energy costs and you're also losing your efficiency. What we have seen, the state of Florida put a grant program together uh, two years ago, a half a million dollars on a 50-50 match for rural communities who had wastewater treatment plants that could not be shut off. What we found immediately was that the results were literally within 24 hours of us removing all of the material. Typically that would be filled to the white line with water and we, could, we clean, there happened to be an individual, the person in the tank is with the city and they're repairing those aerators. We don't, we don't require drawing the water down. That's one of the unique benefits because we're moving the sand in a slurry or other debris. Fats, oils, and greases. Our equipment has been specified throughout the country. Um, Buffalo, New York, Los Angeles, San Antonio, numerous cities in Florida where we have, and many of them cannot operate. We cleaned at the Hyperion Wastewater Treatment Plant, the sixth largest plant in the world. 
We've cleaned in Austin, Texas, wet wells remaining in operation in excess of 100 feet deep while they remain in operation. In San Antonio, we cleaned a sewer pipe a length of almost 3,000 continuous feet, which is, you know, depths and uh, accomplishments that are virtually unheard of in this industry. Where we've been, we were founded on innovation and uh, we believe we solve a real problem. The energy efficiencies that were documented by the state when we did the grant program was a 67% reduction. Keep in mind, when you take the sand out of a box, you have more room in the box. Okay. When we take sand out of a structure, you have more sand for the treatment process. There's a capital cost associated with building that additional space, that additional capacity. There's also energy savings. We believe that the value proposition, if within three years you could pay for the cost of our service call, in three years between the, the um, capital savings and the energy efficiencies, we thought that that would make a lot of sense to a lot of people. What we've learned is the energy savings alone is paying for the, the, the service call in 17 to 18 months. So it makes a huge value proposition. One question that, you know, is pricing, is are we at the right price point? Some would say maybe you could charge more. That's a discussion that's ongoing, and we're looking at the data because we're in a, you know, a lot of the work we do is in a competitive environment. And so we are looking closely at, you know, what is our price point. So from dream to reality, what did it take to get here? You know, first it was an idea. The idea had to have legs. So the idea got built. The idea was a prototype. And then, and then everybody said, we said, this is something really special. And everybody said, we believe you, but we'd like to see it. <laughs> So then we did a Seeing is Believing tour around the state of Florida, and we started, we tested the truck, the prototype, December 6, 2012, in Hudson, Texas. And when I saw what the equipment did, it was amazing. So what we did was a Seeing and Believing tour. We did a proof of concept to run a business, so we built a service company in Florida. We also have two territory partners in Texas and in California. They're building service companies around our technology. We closed on some mezzanine capital. The significance of closing on the capital was there's a lot of hair, a lot of things happen on a startup, a lot of choices get made. Sometimes the only choice is made. And as a result, closing and being, you know, going through the rigors of closing force you to answer all the tough questions and to put in writing the plan for the company. And so the significance of getting some capital was that we had to grow up, put our big boy pants on. Sale, and then it really allowed us the capital to get into the market. And what I refer to is the intellectual jujitsu. The intellectual jujitsu is really meeting the customer where he is. When we were a prototype, customers said, wow, this is amazing. When we were proving the concept, we were doing things that no one else could do. Now we're in a business, we have employees. Now we're in a business, we have equipment. We're in a business, we have crews. And, and all of a sudden, it's very competitive and fierce. And so the money that we spent over the last year has really allowed us to fine tune. And now we're headed into some production. Goal is to develop a profit business operations in Florida, Texas, and California, develop a leasing program for municipalities, and continually refine our plan according to honest feedback. And I had, at the, you know, everybody says feedback, but the challenge when you're where we are is you, you're, we're the believers. We're evangelizing. We're trying to get market acceptance. We hope it leads to market adoption. So we, but we also have to realize that, see the world as it is, not the way we want it to be, in order to make the adjustments so that we can be successful in the future. And with that, I'll go to questions because I got an idea. I ran out of time. Thank you, Dr. I'm going to go ahead and kick us off with the first question. As you're obviously a big advocate of Florida, having worked for our state. Where do you see Polston having the most economic impact? Is it job creation? Is it savings to municipalities? How are you going to impact Florida financially with economic growth? Well, I, I, that's a great question. Let me start with that. Okay. 
Um, which buys me a few time, a few minutes to answer. <laughs> um, recognizing that, I, you know, there's, it's two things. One is we've te we've toyed with the thought in Florida of bringing the manufacturing of our proprietary components. Uh, there's a huge opportunity for the manufacturing. We do our, our it is a patented pending piece of equipment. It's proprietary. We manufacture three pieces of the truck that I showed you, and and so I see that as number one. Number two is, you know, we're paying, you know, in order to get the people that are qualified, we're building a company creating jobs. And, um, and, I, and I also find that if you look at the testimonials, if you look at the letters, the emails that we've gotten from the people responsible for operating and maintaining facilities, we make their life easier because we take, we take a headache away from them. And they, you know, we deal with utilities. Utilities are enterprise funds, so there's some, uh, you know, benefits in that room. Does that answer your question? That's great. Thank you. Do we have two questions here? What was your name again? I'm sorry. Denver. Denver. Good morning. Uh, uh, What's your name? Good morning. My name is Brandon. <laughs> um, was uh, so you said you have a patent on the actual truck. Patent pending. The patent pending on the actual truck, and you have a manufacturer in Ohio. You said. Iowa. In Iowa. Um, I'm That's dyslexic. Okay. We're good. Um, <laughs> um, by the way, I think I think it, your company is amazing. Um, one question, it may be a little bit weird. Does the manufacturer only manufacture yours, or is it a bigger manufacturer for other trucks? That Brandon, sense. that's a good question. We partnered with a company called Wayne USA. Wayne, we, we built these trucks uh, in a facility, in, in, we built our first one in Own, Alaska, and then we were able to work cooperatively with some people in Houston to build the other six that are built. Um, and so we have two in Florida doing service, we have two in Texas, two in California, and Texas is building an industrial truck. As part of the territory agreement, they've agreed, they pay us a licensing fee. I mean, I'm going a little bit further than your question, but I'll come back to it. So they pay us a licensing fee for the exclusive right of a territory, and then we get a royalty off of, off of work generated by their companies. They're joint venture partners, so they had to have a high net worth, and we you know, looked at what they were doing in the market. That in Texas, they've done a lot of oil barge cleaning, in Port Arthur, in, in California, they're doing a lot of wastewater collection systems and treatment systems. Now, to your, um, remind me, uh, I started off, Brandon, you, you dad, help me, remind me the question again, because I just um, lost my train of thought. You had the patent pending on the actual oh, truck, the manufacturer, yeah. yeah. Do, they, do they manufacture yeah, so I, I, Thank you, so we built those. We have patents pending, several patents pending. Yes. Uh, so we refer to it as proprietary, that's the, 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 the term of art, if you're not patented. And then we have a process patent as well, in addition to the, all of the components that we have and the truck as a, as, a, as a combination. The combination of both vacuum and downhole pumping system, which allows us to do dry, damp, and wet, all with one truck, okay? That is patented as well, and trademarked. And we trademarked the name of the combination Q. Now, um, so we partnered with Wayne USA. Wayne builds garbage trucks and street sweepers. But one of the reasons that we were interested in them is they're serving the municipal market. Because they're serving the municipal market, they have 33 dealers and 33 service centers. Because when you start building equipment like this, warranties and periodic maintenance become big issues. And for a lot of cities, they just want to pay you to take care of that for them. So you have to have the facility you can't run around. So it, getting to, uh, so you're really touching on a significant scale-up question. And one of the things that I've, we've learned in that process is to keep it very simple. So, is that answering questions? Yes. Thank you. We have a Sir, good morning. My name is Amada Gonzalez. I, I understand you operate in a highly regulated market. I see this as a dredger. It's pretty much a dredger on wheels yep. is what yep. it seems. Yep. So exactly. when you're returning that affluent, because you said you return it back into the system, I seen a lot of these regulations where they require it to become back even as clean as drinking water. Are you going through a process of, of the affluent being that clean or does that not apply to your system? Well, not if you're IP air. There well Nice question. <laughs> uh, cut, cut. First of all, we just did test the technology in Texas that allows you to treat the water partly out of self-interest because in some of these systems, in California, 
we are involved in a contract to clean 1,000 miles of large diameter pipe. It's a lot of pipe. But because of the drought condition, you can't use hydrants to run your jetters because we have a jetter that acts like a broom that sweeps it down to the manhole and then we pull it out at the manhole. Okay? So as a result, um, we have to clean the water that's in the system clean enough. So that's one use. Regulations don't require clean water unless we were discharging it not in the tank that we we're cleaning it from. If you're cleaning it into the system, you don't because we're actually improving their system because we're taking these materials off the bottom that are floatable and sending them through. They can go through their process. Does that answer your question? Yes. Denver, I'm David. Good morning, David. Good morning. Um, very attractive business model. Congratulations. I'm curious. Why couldn't the truck be downsized into something that would be <clears throat> either a product that your customers would buy or perhaps put on a trailer so that you don't have the entire integrated system but something that could actually be parked for a while or used, deployed in a way that doesn't require necessarily for you to roll a truck and have a service tech doing this? Is this ever going to get smaller? Three pieces to that question. Um, David, number one, uh, we, as we built this prototype and sort of went with the, you know, the ideas of the inventor, we we um, we ended up building sort of the equipment that's capable. What we learned in the market is exactly what you realize is that to scale it up, you have to maybe scale it down, so to speak. And so we we do have uh, in production out in October, November timeframe a version that we're referring to as the Mini. And that's the model that we intend on leasing into manufacturing, into municipalities. There's a big need in the municipality market and the price point with the leasing model gets very attractive very quickly. Now, the second part of it is that uh, we do, we have talked to um, Chevron specifically. They, keep in mind, they pay for the weight of their oil as it crosses into the continent. Sand weighs a lot. They're interested in a rig-mounted unit so there'd be no chassis so that they can go through this process before they bring the material into the, the continent. So that's a ex specific example. The trailer-mounted one is how the equipment was originally built in 1989. It was referred to as the sewer hall. Cleaned about 80 miles of pipe after Katrina, in fact. There are challenges with that, but there are environments where it makes sense. The biggest thing on a trailer is the crane and the stability for the crane. What really adds value is we're reaching out in a dripless tube that we've manufactured and patented. We're pulling this material so there's no, you can't go to, when we clean an API separator in an oil and gas facility, which is where the sand is coming out of, you know, everything that comes up out of the ground has got sand in it. And so this is where they separate the sand. They spend a quarter of a million dollars cleaning those. Um, we can do it without people in confined space, and we can do it for about 90,000 cheaper just because of the access they have to provide to get in and out. So in that, in that case, so, so to answer your question, we're looking at where the technology has application and, and, and trying to go through with our, Wayne has a lot of engineers and designers that are helping us you know, fine tune where it can be, so it's a great point. We had one last question, and it's right here. All right, awesome. Um, my name's Eves. I actually am a wastewater uh, trainee at the, plant, at the plant in Orange County. Which um, one? Uh, Eastern Water Reclamation. Okay, yeah, yeah. Iron, Iron Bridge? No, no, that's uh, City of Orlando. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it's uh, near Alifea. Oh, yeah, I've been, I've been out there. Okay. Or, um, um, hold on a second. Believe it or not, I'm dressed up today, but I've measured a lot of wastewater treatment plants. Yeah, so it's the cheapest step of DEP, I would assume you, you've been around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually had a question as far as um, the product that you, you're selling, as far as the truck goes. Um, have you guys thought about developing anything for in-plant um, uh, grid removal, like because I know in part of the pre-treatment process in, at wastewater plants, they have a grit chamber that's supposed to catch all the sand in the grit that's supposed to actually go, um, that's coming into the plant before it actually reaches the aeration process. So yeah. I was wondering, do you, do you guys have any plans on building anything for like plants that are in construction or in development so that you, know, you can jump into that market as well, or is that? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, we've been tempted. We've been tempted to do that. Um, and I would say we're tempted. I would say one of those challenges uh, 
just observing over the last 10 years and doing sort of this kind of stuff, eight years, is stay focused. And so I would say, I don't see immediate needs. Now, if an opportunity was to merge with somebody who's doing that or to align or partner, I would jump on it because I do, we're both trying to save to solve the same problem. But I will tell you, as far as I'm concerned, they're competition. And, and we clean a million gallon, plants are rated in million gallons per day, as you know. And so for a million gallons per day, we clean for fifty to $75,000. You, the, if you look at the bid tabs of grit chambers built that have a life of 10 to 15 years, uh, it's 114 to $250 per million gallons normalized in Florida. So we look, we've researched that. It has come up a couple of times. The other thing is, you, you know, we give people a quick study of particle dynamics. At six feet per second, sand is moving. At two feet per second, sand, it takes six to pick it up, two to keep it moving, two feet per second. So what happens in some of these systems is the grid chambers are built on average daily flows. So if your average daily flow, they work. But if the sand is suspended and it, it's traveling faster than the grid chamber can treat it, it, all, it ends up in the aeration basin anyways. So what you look at is, you know, it, it's intended to be a great fix, but a lot of systems we clean, we've cleaned grit chambers, but in a lot of systems we clean, we're still cleaning sand out of the next step from the aeration, grit chamber and then aeration, and we're still cleaning the aeration. So it's a good question. Orange County's got a great utility. They actually sole sourced our equipment. Um, John Hawk uh, down there at uh, Sand Lake Road. Uh, the problem, they ended up going and solving in a different way, but they went through the procurement process for our equipment. So that was a big, big success back in November 2013. Well, Denver, in the spirit of One Million Cups, what's something that we, as your community today, can help you with? I would say what I'm interested in is uh, uh, Ray Watson's here. He's been leading a CEO roundtable that I've been a participant of, and, and he keeps us in, uh, uh, involved and informed of different opportunities. And when I saw this and I went online to apply, and I said, you know, this would be a great opportunity to just sort of share our journey for those that are in a journey. And then to say, you know, this is where I am. I'm, I, I'm not sure what I need because I've never been here before. So I would be, what I would say is if you've got any ideas or suggestions or thoughts, we're interested in potentially moving our manufacturing, up, so a very select piece to Florida. Um, there's an opportunity there. We have territory partners where we have people who really understand the industry, but they're undercapitalized in, in some states. Uh, there's partnering there that's an opportunity. And I don't know what the future holds. We, we, my goal right now is to get the company bankable so that the, the, the funds that I've, I have borrowed, we can look, reduce the cost of capital. And that's only when we're bankable and people who can objectively look at our numbers feel comfortable. So that's my highest priority. So anybody who has ideas or suggestions, and I would say we have an office in Maitland, and uh, we're also always looking for interns as well. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Denver. want to say thank you guys so much for coming out to One Million Cups this Wednesday. If it is your first Wednesday, please come back like Miss Angela had really pushed for. We are always looking for audience members, but we're always looking for entrepreneurs. So even if you know of a friend of a friend of a friend, encourage them to come our way. We're in 90 cities. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. We're all the way from Alaska down to Puerto Rico. So once you present with us, our entrepreneurs this morning, you can present anywhere in the United States that One Million Cups are. So we have five locations in Florida right now, so that's our passport program. Other than that, give some love to Rollins, give some love to Barney's for the coffee, and shout out to our live caster. We'll take it, that's okay, we'll take it, we'll take it. But thank you guys so much. Follow us online. We submit of a lot of emails that are coming out. We do a lot of love on Twitter lot on Facebook, like us on Facebook, and have a good Wednesday.